some time ago, the commissioner for justice, etc., wrote in a tweet, I'm convinced the GDPR rules will offer a competitive advantage for companies. And I tweeted, yes, companies face data obesitas and pattern obesitas. And the GDPR compliance will force a lean, agile approach to data-driven applications. I'm not sure if that is what she meant. Yesterday, in the wake of all the excitement about certain companies, Wolfie Crystal gave us a whole thread of links to other companies that are explaining, I'm giving you an example of one of the companies. I would say it's a very reputable company, SAP, um, about what sort of data <coughs> they get where <coughs> and what they do with them. And I think it's very interesting not to focus just on this incident, because it shows that it was not an incident. And then of course, some people like to have fun. This is about somebody saying, if someone from northern Utah likes peas, but not mayonnaise, and sleeps on the left side of the bed, they're more likely to vote <coughs> for a Lutarian. And the capture below is what makes this interesting. It says, sounds like garbage, but it is science. <laughs> now, I'm a bit worried about that. First of all, think, I think that the competitive advantage of the GDPR is not just for companies, but also for Europe. And of course, it will get better data protection. But more interestingly, I think it will give us better machine learning. And I'm going to explain that. Then I think, relating to the other jokes, that everybody is now assuming that micro-targeting works. But it may not work at all. Maybe everybody now thinks that it sounds like science, what we just saw. And it may be garbage. That depends on a lot of things. The problem is, even if it doesn't work in that sense, it still works if decisions are based on it. So as we all know, the whole business model of free services has actually reconfigured markets based on the belief that micro-targeting and advertising works. Now, what it does to our democracy, to political discourse, is that it frames political opinion as a preference. Like, you like red wine, I like Democrats. You know, what's the difference? <laughs> so I want to briefly go into the political economy of data-driven platforms because that is related to the point I really want to make, and that is about data totalitarianisms. I know that sounds far-fetched and heavy, but that's why we arranged this incident so that you have some idea that maybe it's true. <laughs> then we go into, briefly, machine learning. I'm sure many of you know more about that than I do. I am a lawyer and a philosopher. I work in a law faculty. But I have the privilege and the pleasure to also have a small chair, I can just sit on it, <laughs> at a science department. <laughs> oh no, thank you. Um, at a science department uh, of another university. So I am working together with data scientists. And I must say, I'm teaching law to computer scientists, master students, and it's a joy, I can't say. It's a party time, actually. Um, and then the real thing that I want to talk about is that we need li primitives of legal protection. So I think we need a reformation of competition law. We need perhaps better consumer law. We need to do all this at a global level, which is not easy. But I think if we do not get protection at the level of the data ecosystem and data-driven architectures, 
these other laws are never going to be able to do their work. Quickly about platforms. So platforms are technical architectures built on top of the internet and the web. Uh, they allow others to build applications, apps, and also APIs. And we have now discovered that the real thing happens in the APIs. That's the gateway. At the same time, platforms are corporate assemblages that incorporate, literally in the legal sense, horizontal and vertical competitors. <coughs> also, platforms have a very important role in the sharing economy, and we have AI platforms, so sharing economy, Uber, Airbnb, AI platforms, uh, Watson. The real problem here is cross-contextual data linking and cross-contextual targeting. And so the data link is the process and the targeting is how individual persons get targeted. This is all based on a combination of two very important things, and especially their combination makes it so forceful. And that is the hyper-connectivity, that is of course key to both the internet and the World Wide Web and the computational back end of these systems and I've called that elsewhere, the development of an external digital unconscious, <coughs> unconscious also because the data-driven aspect, uh, aspect, especially the data-driven machine learning aspect, is not about conscious decision-making or rule-based artificial intelligence like we had in the 80s, but it's about something that is very close to our own unconscious. So, again, very briefly, other people are much more qualified to talk about it, but still it's important and very important for the point I want to make. We are now in an economy at a global level where a lot of monopolies work and where there is debate about whether competition law, national law normally, is up to the task. There is also something called monopsonies, which is the concentration of buying power. Think of labor markets, especially in the sharing economy. My main concern for this topic is that competition law at this moment, as it functions, mainly focuses on whether consumer price is kept low. Other concerns are sort of swept off the table. The problem with the current data ecosystem is that consumer price seems to be very low, so it's okay. We even have an architecture, data-driven architecture with these platforms that seems to wipe the price away. I think basically I'm not the only one <coughs> that consumers are now paying an excessive price. An excessive price is legal technical terminology. If there is an excessive price, then competition law becomes applicable. But that excessive price is not visible at this moment because we are all in for free services. So we have market failure here. Costs are externalized. And we can say the same thing about uh, the sharing economy, all sorts of problems that appear, and about monopsonies. I want to talk about that first point and I want to talk about the rise of a new kind of behaviorism. Behaviorism was social science, um, a lot can be said about it, we're not going to do that now. What makes it interesting here is that social science was something that social scientists did and they were doing it together and blah blah blah. We're now talking about a system, an architecture that is built on the assumptions of behaviorism and on very peculiar assumptions. Basically, machine learning assumes that a mathematical target function underlies all human behavior. If you are doing, if you are doing machine learning with behavioral data, and you do not assume this, you cannot do <coughs> machine learning, full stop. Hmm? Now, you can say behaviorism is a reductive thing. 
I would say that, and I think many people would say that. For me, that doesn't mean that behaviorism is bad. On the contrary, it's very interesting and it's very productive. But the second that you forget that it's a reduction, you're in bad waters. And I think that's what we are now. There was a very interesting and maybe famous, maybe you've also seen it, uh, discussion between Dawkins and Zuckerberg. When you're very famous, you get to talk to each other, you know. <laughs> and, and Dawkins said to Zuckerberg, what would you really like to know? What's your real interest, research interest? And Zuckerberg said, and I'm quoting from the internet, I have the reference. I'm looking for, I'm wondering, he said, whether there's a fundamental mathematical law underlying human social relationships that governs the balance of who and what we, are, we all care about. Silence, then he says, I bet there is. Now this is very important. And I, I'm, I think I buy this. I think he is not interested in money. If you have so much money, you can quite afford not to be interested. But long before that, all the offers to buy he rejected. I think this is what he's interested in. Yeah. Now, I think that all these data-driven architectures, and I'm also talking about cyber-physical systems, smart grids, <coughs> smart homes, smart cities, robotics, think of the most spectacular form of robotics that we're now all talking about, uh, self-driving cars, which are also called driverless cars, just think about that difference and the totally different assumptions that has. Anyway, there seems to be a kind of omniscience. I call it pseudo-omniscience because I don't think there is any omniscience at all. But there is again an assumption, an assumption that if we put all the data from clinical research or whatever together, we're definitely going to solve all human disease. And these assumptions are in all these fields. And if the idea is also, if you can put all that together and then put some general artificial intelligence on top of it, then we're in the realm of singularity and all problems of humanity will be solved. Probably even humanity itself will be resolved because uh, <laughs> I think actually for an general artificial intelligence, we would definitely be the problem. Um, I think this is actually not happening and also not going to happen. <coughs> and I tend to believe that most people who speak out on this do not believe that if they are computer scientists, uh, the people who have all these uh, fearful stories and dystopias are usually not um, uh, really deep into the field. So we have a pseudo-omniscient data-driven architecture that has a lot of consequences as long as we believe it and decisions are taken based on that assumption and that is related to the production of a seamless data ecosystem, this digital unconscious that we basically allow um, to rule our society. Last thing about platforms, think of the Greek Agora and the Roman Forum they were places for buying and selling, marketplaces, part of the private sphere, but they were also places of political discourse. Parliament, parler, speak, places to speak, to discuss, to liberate, public sphere. Um, I think, I'm talking about totalitarianisms, that it's important to, to look historically at the difference between a tyranny and a totalitarian rule. And of course, they can overlap. Tyranny means that one has no public sphere, that the public sphere is the private property of the prince, of the king, of the emperor. Absolutism. But the private sphere is sort of left alone because who cares? Why should the ruler care about what you do in your private life? Right, so public <coughs> life is the ownership. Totalitarianism goes deeper and further. 
it means that you destroy the private sphere, that you do not allow a private sphere, that you invade it and try to steer what happens there. So, of course, great works have been written about how this has been done in the past. And I think we have to face to what extent such things are happening now. This is a matter of empirical investigation, not about throwing name cards. So now I want to go quickly into machine learning. For some of you, this will all be obvious. Um, I always like to remind us of the famous definition by Tom Mitchell in his handbook. Computer program is said to learn from experience, E, with respect to some class of tasks, T, and performance metric, P. If its performance at task T is measured by P, improves with experience, E. I find that a wonderful definition. It doesn't say anything too much, but also not anything too less. It's like poetry <laughs> and mathematics, which is in some sense the same. Now, of course, there's a lot of politics in who gets to determine E, T, and P. E is the training and the validation set. Question, first question is, have you done out-of-sample testing or not? T is the task. Task must be machine-readable, right? Then it must be usually made in steps. Machine has to understand the task. So it's going to be domain experts and machine learners that are going to sit down together to develop the task. Now you can develop for the same task that we have, um, like less pollution, great task. Now if you want a machine to learn something about that, you have to make all sorts of decisions about where are the training data here that are relevant, training and validation data, where do you stop, how do you curate, cleanse them, etc., etc., etc. How are you going to formulate the task such that the machine can actually learn something? Who is going to formulate it? Maybe it would be good to formulate five, six, seven different tasks and then to see how the machine does and to train on different sets, etc. Now we get to the performance metric. Let's test four, five, six performance metrics. Hey, two of them give you very high accuracy. 95% outperforming human experts. Four, say, 56, 62. That's about like gambling, right? Guessing, yeah? So if you're a consultant, which performance metric do you think you're going to use? Hmm? Okay, so there is politics here. The ethics is, of course, in how they are determined, with what in the back of your mind, and law concerns the contestability of each. Very important is the notion of ground truth. When we were first confronted as lawyers, as philosophers, with the ground truth, we were absolutely flabbergasted. We didn't know you could actually grind the truth. <laughs> um, but uh, obviously that is possible if you want to parse. Parsing is an important term in machine learning. Um, anyway, the whole idea of truth for philosophers is very problematic. Thank God, philosophers, there is a whole stream of philosophy which is about pragmatism. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the, the, the grinding machine is a joke. Yeah. Ground means let's look at the ground outside the data set where things are really happening and, and check that. The point is that it's usually domain experts who are going to sit down together and decide the ground truth via uh, surveys or if you think about medical experts, the experts are going to sit down together and decide. Now, surprise, experts, if they're good, if they're scientists, for instance, they're going to disagree. So to make the ground truth work for machine learning, you have to say, well, these three radiologists disagree. The third one I never liked, so we leave that one out. The other, yeah, well, we can sort of take the average. If you hear me well, that means your entire machine learning design has now already been, there is a decent term for that, but um, it, it won't be very reliable, let's put it that way. This is something that is behind terms like high performance accuracy, outperforming human beings, and 
uh, optimization. So, of course, this is an exaggeration, but it's early morning and we have to have some fun. And there is some ground truth in this, I do think. So there are all these terms, uh, training data, validation data, are you testing out of sample? How did you discuss ground truth? Who has been labeling this data? Has it been labeled in alternative ways? And see what that makes in terms of a difference, outcome. The whole idea of outperforming human expertise, I think, is a very tricky idea. Maybe it's a sales pitch. Optimization and predictive accuracy are often framed as a trade-off with interpretability. I wonder if something is not interpretable, how can it ever outperform a human? Because it means the human doesn't really, cannot interpret it. And so that means you're only looking at output, uh, and that is very uh, problematic. Now back to the mathematical stuff. You could say that the only thing that machine learning is very good at is saying, I have this data, which will always be historical data, because you cannot train on future data. Always historical data. I have this data, and I want to compress all that data, 10 trillion data. I want to compress them into one mathematical formula. That is machine learning. It's nothing else. It's one way of describing it, of course. But I'm curious to your reaction, whether somebody would deny that. Hmm? It's, it's nearly Shannon hmm? compression. So that compression is always in terms of some task, right? Unsupervised learning meaning could mean that you give it as a task, find whatever best way to compress this set. Hmm? But you'll still have to develop a hypothesis space and you're, you, you can't have all the hypotheses thinkable. Mm -hmm. So any big data can be defined, compressed in many ways, amongst which will be many spurious ways. And it's not always obvious which are the spurious ways. Let's skip this. Um, if you look at Gödel and Wolpert, um, I'm, I'm not going to go deep into that, but then from the perspective of mathematics, um, there is a fundamental undecidability in machine learning that you cannot in any way eradicate, which is related to the fact that you cannot train on future data. It also means that any data can be computed, compressed, in different ways. That means contestability becomes very important. Okay, so... Let's look at what the GDPR does. And I want to discuss three aspects of the GDPR. Consent, data minimization, and purpose limitation. And then we come to the automated decisions and the profile transparency. Let's first look at consent. So I think the GDPR enables us, if it is going to be enforced, which I think it is, Article 78 to 83, have a sort of a closed system of enforcement. You want to complain, you go to the <coughs> DPA. DPA doesn't do what you want, you go court. Ask the court to tell the DPA. You can also go separately to the court and ask an injunction. I want this company to stop processing my data now. Under Article 80, an NGO can do that. Don't need national law for that. If you want compensation, yes, you will depend on whether your jurisdiction accepts that. But if you don't want compensation, if you just want an injunction, basically you have the class action here. There is private law liability and there are the high fines. So you're talking to the board of companies, not to the information board. So this system is very clever. So if this is going to be actually enforced, then um, what is important is that from now on, the legal ground of consent requires explicitly consent for specified, explicitly specified purposes. 
all the other legal grounds, there are five other legal grounds which are each very important. On necessity grounds, usually people think that consent is not a necessity ground, but it is. From now on it is. Article 5 says processing must be adequate, relevant and limited to what is necessary for. That was not the case under the Data Protection Directive. So we now have a new necessity ground. You can't just give consent. And once you have consent as a company, the processing will have to be necessary for the legal ground and if it is consent for the purpose, actually always for the purpose. Um, the burden of proof is with the controller. The consent has to be made uh, explicit and um, separately it has to be highlighted. Um, if, if there's something wrong with consent, it's simply invalid, it's void, it doesn't exist. That means you're processing unlawful. There is the right to withdraw at any time. And then we have the fact that this withdrawal has to be as easy as giving consent. Just think of what companies and governments will have to do in the back end of their systems. Yes, they have to do something in their interface, obviously, but that, that's not so difficult. What they have to do in the back end of their system to make this possible. So I want to be a pain in the ass. I say, I give consent. Okay, the data can be processed. Ten minutes later, I say, bad. I withdraw. Processing has to stop. Four weeks later, I say consent. Two weeks after that, not. At some point, the court will say, and the data protection uh, supervisor will say, you are just trying to bug the system. Yeah? But um, if this is serious, the, the processing must be able to be stopped within reasonable time after withdrawing. That's an enormous task for companies. And I think if companies and government do that in their backend system, make this work, they're going to do much, much, much better machine learning because they will have much better data. They will, this will be a, a form of cleansing. And they will have to think better whether they have the relevant data. Um, then there is the famous Article 7.4 that says that uh, considering whether consent is given freely, account must be taken of whether the performance of a contract, including the provision of a service, is conditional on the consent while not necessary for the performance. This is explained in our, uh, recital 43, which is not legally binding in the, in the sort of naive sense of the term legally binding, but uh, which gives the explanation. And there it goes a bit stronger. Consent is presumed not to be given freely if the performance of a contract, including the provision of a service, is dependent on the consent, despite such consent not being necessary. Think of a tracking wall pro prohibition. Yeah? So if you go to a site and the site says, I'm going to place cookies, and um, if you don't accept the cooking cookies that I do not need for technical or functional reasons. I don't need them. That's why I need your consent, because if you're not giving consent for that additional processing, you're going black. If we have to believe this, that is unlawful processing, not allowed. Yeah. If this is enforced, a lot of business models will have to be transformed. Actually, the whole free service model will have to be reformed. And my position is that this is very good for machine learning and very good for our society. Uh, in the European Parliament version of the e-privacy uh, regulation, there was an explicit um, uh, cookie wall prohibition that has 
gone out from the council version. Let's see. It will take some time. Now, let's quickly do data minimization and purpose limitation. Um, processing has a very broad definition. Personal data has a very broad definition. There always has to be a legal ground, consent, contract, vital interests of the data subject, a statutory obligation, public task, or the legitimate interest of the data controller. There has to be an explicit and specified purpose, and processing must be necessary, both for the ground and for the purpose. Purpose limitation is the central principle of data protection. Why? Because whoever de facto, not officially, de facto determines the purpose is controller. On top of that, it is the controller that is responsible and liable for violations, and the controller has the burden of proof there, for instance, for consent, but he also has to document all the processing. That documentation has to be in good order. Processing is only allowed if necessary for specified purpose. So purpose is totally central. Now, many people would say, oh, this is against innovation. How can the European Union do this to us, right? There are these other continents, and they're really getting on with AI and all, all sorts of other innovative tools. I think we are going to have the competitive advantage because purpose limitation is core to good machine learning. There is even a professor of medical informatics who has nothing to do with data protection, not interested in just trying to do good uh, medical research, who formulated in the 90s the first law of informatics. Data shall be used only for the purpose for which they were collected. Collateral, if no purpose was defined, they should not be used. That's a very strict position. Hmm? And uh, there's a lot to say about that. But it's basically core to good machine learning. Think about the purpose because it determines what data are relevant. Are you just going to take low-hanging fruit or are you going to actually sit down and say, what sort of data do I need? Hmm? Uh, development of the task for the machine, of course, depends on the purpose that you have formulated. And the performance metric, um, basically, if you choose it well, the machine will learn well and you might achieve your purpose. If you choose the performance metric, bad because you have to sell it, or whatever other incentive you have, uh, you might never reach your purpose. So, contrary to what uh, some or even many colleagues of mine, lawyers, write, machine learning is not possible without specifying a task. Many of my colleagues say, oh, purpose limitation is so outdated. On the contrary. Um, Interesting purpose specification is, of course, not exactly the same as the task that is developed by um, a machine learner. There is a distance to bridge between the two. And when you look at what is the actual purpose, or the actual task, then you're basically talking about to improve the user interface to influence user behavior. All A-B testing, and this is, of course, all about the micro-targeting that we're talking about. Now, I have a whole series of slides on the last topic that I'm just going to swish through. Um, undoubtedly, we'll be talking about that afterwards. So profiling is defined. Note that in the GDPR, profiling is defined in terms of the construction of profiles. Um, note that there, are, uh, there is an obligation to provide three types of transparency. So the first obligation is to notify somebody that there is automated decision making. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good thing. I want to know when I'm talking to a machine. The second is um, that you must have some meaningful information about the logic involved. Um, there is now a whole library of 
people writing about that, I'm not sure that that is always very helpful. Let's not amongst lawyers bicker about this or that, but let's see that as one of the three transparency um, requirements. The other one is to look at the envisaged consequences. And that's very good. It's nice to know the logic of processing, but what you basically want to know is what is that going to do to me? Uh, there are obligation to provide that information. Controllers cannot wait for a request. They have to simply provide it, full stop. That's new. And that is mirrored in Article 15 with a right. Uh, then we have Article 22.1. Um, which is implied in the transparency uh, obligations. And it says the data subjects shall have the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing. <laughs> I'm going to go very quickly here um, and highlight uh, some of the important things. Uh, first, people are always talking about, it says, solely automated. So it's going to be very important if at some point the courts are going to define what that means. Article 29, working party says, if there is a human in the loop who actually doesn't know what he's doing and is just pushing buttons or repeating what the system says, most help desks. Um, basically, that's solely automated decision. Hmm? Uh, the Article 29 Working Party calls this fabrication of human involvement. And uh, I, I think in many jurisdictions, uh, courts can be very pragmatic here. So there are three exceptions to this, and it's important um, that in the case of such exceptions, it is, it is the human that has to come back in and um, basically, there has to be a conversation, and there is a right to be able to contest these decisions. Hmm? Contestability, the heart of the law, rule of law. Um, if these data architectures are making all sorts of decisions, and one, you don't know about them, two, you don't know the consequences, and three, you have no way to contest them, then you're in the realm of totalitarianism, whether you have competition law or consumer protection or not. <coughs> if you parse this, if you break this up and make it actionable, which I think is happening here, then consent can become meaningful because consent will become a very difficult ground for a data controller to use, yes. So um, there is a prohibition for discriminatory uh, profiling, of course. I'm going to, the, the slides will be shared. So if, if you like the GDPR or if you think it's important, <laughs> they are nice. <laughs> it's not always the same thing, I know. Um, <laughs> you, you can just um, follow them because they are quotes. They are quotes from the GDPR just split up so that they make more sense. Now, this is not a quote from the GDPR. I think it's very important, and this is uh, moving towards the end, that we don't confuse getting an explanation with getting a justification, right? So if somebody makes decisions about you that affect you, you need a justification. Now, that, that is the case in... Um, Administrative law, because we have the legality principle there, that is clear. There's no discussion about that. Uh, theses are being written about this. Y you can give somebody an explanation, but if you have no justification, the explanation is not going to help one bit. In the private realm, it's more complex. Usually the justification is, I have the freedom to contract. I can do whatever I want. Sounds like a justification. In legal terms, you could say that this is Article 16 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which 
says there is a fundamental right to the freedom to conduct a business. And I like the fact that that is, and I think that's quite unique, a fundamental right in the Union. That means we are talking about a clash between fundamental rights. But it also immediately clarifies that like privacy and data protection are not unlimited, this right is also not unlimited. So there are all sorts of restrictions on that right. When you talk about a justification, also in the private realm, this might not be enough. Consumer law, competition law, data protection law, there are all sorts of restrictions on other human rights. Um, we've already discussed this. Um, yes, the last thing I want to say is if we are talking explanation, because I think it would be very interesting for lawyers to begin to trace the connection between explanation and justification. When and how is an explanation relevant for the justification? Hmm? Now, there's a wonderful text by um, uh, Hoffman, Sharma, and Watts, Duncan Watts, Science of Networks. Man. He, they distinguish between exploratory and confirmatory research. Exploratory research means you're playing around, you're testing all sorts of things. Great. What they say is, if you do that testing, it's great. But when you report the finding, if you, if you want to claim that it means anything, you should transparently declare the full sequence of design choices. Because each design choice has trade-offs. And you should, at least when you're experimenting, show results with different performance metrics. Otherwise, you're not seriously experimenting. However, if you want to claim that this is serious business, that the explanation has justificatory dimensions, you will have to do confirmatory research. And that is something else. And one of the things that they say, just like in medical research, you must then actually pre-register your research design such that all the research design decisions that you have taken can be checked. And you'll probably have to go into causality. Let's go immediately to the end. You might think it never came, but it does. <laughs>